A big thank you to Squarespace for sponsoring this week's video. If you need a website or a domain, go to squarespace.com forward slash James for 10% off your first purchase. Hi everyone, um, I pressed record and then my laptop died. So I've just rebooted it. Hopefully that fixes the problems. We'll see. Today what I thought I'd do is talk a little bit about composition, which is probably the thing that I'm asked most about in photography and I've not spoken about it for ages, so I thought today we could revisit it. Um, there are lots of composition videos on YouTube, lots of information on blogs and in books and stuff, but most of it I have found centres on the rules. Rule of thirds, rule of odds, rule of space, leading lines, negative space, filling the frame, packing the foreground, all that stuff, all good stuff, powerful techniques. And as useful as those techniques can be, I have found, particularly when you're dealing with beginners, that often it will end up informing what they shoot, not just how they shoot. And the issue with that is that if you've got a boring subject, it doesn't matter how you shoot it, and if you've got a leading line towards it, it's still gonna be boring. So uh, today what I thought I'd do is talk through how I think about what to shoot, and just as importantly, how I shoot it, in the hope that it's, I don't know, interesting, maybe useful. It's not the way, it's just a way. As with all photography, there is no right and wrong. But uh, yes, let's, let's see if this laptop works. Uh, now, the easiest part of photography, as far as I'm concerned, is working out what it is that we want to photograph. Uh, and the reason that I think it's the easiest part of photography is that my parameters are pretty loose, really. Basically, if I see something that I think looks nice, I will want to photograph it. Now, of course, those things will be different for all of us. Some of us like mountains, some of us like dogs, some of us like insects. Now, the difficult bit, and in fact, I think the hardest bit of photography is working out how to photograph those things. And in the main, that's what I wanna talk about today. Now, every film or movie has a lead actor, or most of them do. And every film or movie, or most of them, have supporting actors. And typically, the job of the supporting actor is to make the lead actor stand out in some way. And so dialogue with the supporting actor can make the lead actor seem a bit softer. And equally, if the supporting actor needs saving in some way, then the lead actor can look caring or tough. But in many instances, the relationship between a supporting actor and a lead actor is crucial for the story. And I think it's exactly the same in photography. So. We have our main subjects in our photos, the thing that caught our eye, but we also have supporting subjects, and it's the job of those supporting subjects to accentuate the main subject. And maybe they'll be accentuating the beauty, the size, the texture, the mood, but in some way, they will be helping our main subject stand out. So this photo here, I think is a pretty good example of that. We've got the caravan, which is the main subject, and then this tree overhanging it, which I would suggest is a supporting subject. And I suppose it's kind of acting as like a shelter, a protector of some kind, but I'd also say it's a crucial part of the story of this caravan. And whenever I'm photographing something like this, and I see pretty much straight away that the supporting subject really is supporting the main subject and not distracting from it, then I know for sure that I want to include it in my scene. The question then becomes, how much of it do I want to include in my scene? Because the key with this photo, and indeed all photos, is trying to work out your quantities. How much of your supporting subject do you need to show for it to adequately support your main subject without distracting from the main subject? And so if I was to crop into this caravan, I think you'd completely lose the sense of place that you get with a large percentage of this tree in the frame. Similarly, if I'd have gone for a wider focal length or if I'd shot this from further back and ended up with more of the tree in the frame, I think the result would have ended up with the subject being too small in the frame and not prominent enough. I say the subject, the caravan. And so for me, composition is really working out this dance between the supporting elements and the main subject and how they can both complement each other the best. And if you look through my portfolio, there are plenty of examples where I've got a supporting subject, but where I don't include the entire supporting subject. And more often than not, that's because I want a supporting subject, I really feel it adds to the scene. But my concern is that by including the entire supporting subject, I would dilute the impact of the main subject. So that's definitely the case with these electricity pylons in Abu Dhabi. I like how the supporting subject in the foreground acts as a frame for the one in the distance. But were I to include any more of the one in the foreground, then I think the one in the background, the main subject, 
would just become inconsequential. Is that a word? Have I made that up? Inconsequential. It sounds right. Uh, here's another one. So this is a mine down in Cornwall. You might remember this from a video last year. Uh, and at the mine was this tower that you see on the right hand side of this image. And in this photo, I decided not to include the entire thing for fear of diluting the main subject. And so like I say, my mindset is this constant dance between how the supporting subjects interact with the main subject. And ultimately what we're trying to do is work out what adds to the story and what distracts from the story. And it's tricky because that will always be down to personal opinion. So let's take these wheelbarrows, for example, which I shot down in Cornwall last year as well. Now I could have made this shot an awful lot simpler by taking 10 paces to my right. And then I basically could have got a profile of them just with the sea behind. Or if I'd got lower, I wouldn't have even had to have had the ocean. I could have just had three wheelbarrows in a line and then a wall behind them. And so what I've chosen to do actively is to position myself to include an awful lot more than that. And in my view, the things that I've chosen to add have added to the story and to the shot. But of course you may disagree. You may find the stuff in the background super distracting and think the photo is just way too complicated. Uh, same with this shot. So this was another one from the frost last winter. Uh, we've got the sheep, we've got this bright orange tree, we've got the steam coming off this farm or factory, whatever it is, then we've got the moon. So on the one hand, it looks like quite a simple scene, I think because of the color palette more than anything else, but also there's quite a lot going on. And how much you include and how much you take away from a shot will always be down to personal preference. But working out what you think is distracting and what you think adds, I think is the crux of good photography. And I should say actually, that whenever there are more than two elements in a scene, so here we've got arguably four potential subjects, whenever that's the case, spacing and waiting are key. And if you've got one half of the image, which is super crowded, where all other potential subjects are sitting, it's probably not gonna look all that nice on the eye. Oh, the other thing I should say about this image, and photos like this, I can show you some other examples too, is that regardless of whether you choose to include or not include the entirety of a supporting subject, you need to be deliberate about it. So with this shot, for example, there is some space between the subjects and the edge of the frame. And that, I have found, is crucial if you're going to include the entirety of a subject. Because the closer to the edge of a frame a supporting subject or a main subject gets, the more likely it is to look cluttered, distracting, or just like a mistake. Uh, now sometimes supporting subjects will present themselves to you in such a way that it's so obvious how to shoot them that you don't even really need to think about it. Uh, this one's a good example of that, these penguins that I shot in Antarctica. I knew I wanted the hut as well and I knew I wanted the mountains. They're two fantastic supporting subjects. And so it was just entirely obvious immediately how I had to shoot that. Uh, this is another good example, again in Cornwall, where the swell was coming in in such a direction that basically meant the waves were pointing up to the buildings from the corner of the frame. And it just meant that the supporting elements, i.e. the waves, presented themselves in such a way that it was so obvious that you had to shoot it like that. But then other times I'll find scenes which kind of look nice, but I'll have to hunt a bit for a supporting element. Uh, and this house is a pretty good example of that. So it's a nice enough country house surrounded by greenery, but I don't think it's a particularly strong or compelling image. But luckily after a bit of hunting, I found a track leading to the house. And that track basically became a really effective supporting element. And therefore it was an absolute no brainer to try multiple ways of including that in the frame. So yeah, the rules, they're great. Rule of thirds, all that, fantastic. But I think what matters equally is having a grasp of main subject and supporting subject and how they can be gelled together to create the most impactful shot. So to summarize, uh, I will go out and try and find something that makes me think, oh, that's nice. Uh, I'll then look around the subject to try and see if there's anything that adds to the subject or distracts from it. Uh, and subsequently, I'll then try and work out how I can add some of the stuff into my frame that supports the subject and how I can get rid of some of the stuff that doesn't. And finally, once I'm in a place where I've done that, I'll then try and work out if I can use focal lengths or moving forward or backwards or getting low or high or whatever to try and work out how I can best emphasize the relationship between those elements and how I can utilize the supporting subjects to maximize the prominence 
of the main subject. And when I say prominence, I don't just mean the size in the frame. I mean the impact that the subject has on you, given its surroundings. And sometimes supporting subjects are really simple. It can just be negative space around a subject. And other times it's more of a jigsaw where you've got four or five competing subjects and you're trying to work out how to piece them together in such a way that they add up to more than the sum of their parts rather than less than the sum of their parts. But in short, that is how I go about trying to work out not just what to shoot, but how to shoot it. And hopefully it made some sense. Anyway, thank you for listening to me uh, rub it on for, how long I've been talking? Can't see. Uh, and also, thank you to the sponsor of this week's video, Squarespace. So many of the photos that I've shown you today are in my portfolio and therefore on my website because my website, my Squarespace website, is my portfolio. And one of my favorite things in life to do is sit with a coffee and curate my favorite images. And if I get back from a trip and I've got a couple more portfolio shots, then sitting down and trying to work out how to add them to my portfolio and where they should sit in my portfolio, given their tone, given their storyline, given their mood, that is just a process that I absolutely love. And of course, there are many ways you can do that. Some people like to curate books, other people like to do zines, and I love to do those things too. But a website is something that you can revisit time and time again, and you can just sit there and sequence all day until your heart's content. So if you would like to check out Squarespace for yourself, you can do so for free by going to squarespace.com to start your free trial. And you can select a template, find one that looks pretty good to you. And then it's just a case of drag and drop and ordering your photos as you wish. And then when you've got a website that you're happy with at the end of your trial, if you'd like to make a purchase, you can save 10% off that first purchase by going to squarespace.com forward slash James. Yeah, and a big thank you to them for their continued support of this channel and to you for watching. Uh, next week, we'll be back outside. I always say that, but we will. I'm not doing two indoor videos in a row. And like I said, I think at the end of last week's video, it'll probably be in the rain, but that's okay. I'll see you then.